Hello, Teachers Institute teachers. This is Mitch Bloomer welcoming you to day two of the 2020 Holocaust Center Teachers Institute. Today, I'm going to give you a, a very quick run through of the 20 year period of time between 1919 and 1939, starting with the founding of the Nazi Party and taking us up through their assumption of power in Germany in January of 1933, and then on to the moments just before the beginning of World War II. So when we deal with this early period of the Nazi era, uh, one of the things we ought to think about is what kind of questions do students want to ask about the rise of the Nazi party and how they became the leaders of Germany? Questions like, how could a group like the Nazis have ever come to power in a modern civilized nation? Or um, what kind of tactics did the Nazis use so that they were successful when an outside observer might have thought that such a group could never come to power? Um, did they fool the German people or did the German nation go into this Nazi era with their eyes wide open? Um, why was Hitler personally so popular and popular all the way up to close to the end of World War II? Um, why did the Nazis target or hate Jews? Now, of course, we've been addressing that question already, but we'll continue to do so today. And uh, what can we learn from this terrible tragedy? Uh, we don't want to see a group like the Nazis ever become the leaders of another nation again. Uh, so what lessons are embedded in this history for us to take? Now, of course, the, the key for us as teachers is to recognize that not a single one of these questions has a definitive answer uh, that's easy or that can come from only one source. There are no real monocausal explanations in the Holocaust. Um, however, we can say that the Holocaust unfolded over four stages over time. Um, and, and in the teaching of history, we, we want to respect the interplay between continuity and change. The continuity was that the Nazis never changed their mind about their ultimate goal with regard to the Jews. They always wanted to remove them from the life of the German people and its territory. What changed over time is what they meant when they said remove. So here very quickly are the first four stages. Uh, the first one is to segregate the Jews within Germany, removing their influence uh, from German society. And the Nazis were, were able to actually begin doing this through the use of propaganda to defame and, and dehumanize and marginalize Jews even before they became the leaders of Germany. But once they did take over, this segregation period was mainly from 1933 to the period right around the time of the Olympic Games in 1936. The second stage was to, to put increasing pressure on the Jews to actually leave Germany. Now, of course, the Nazis have been trying to do this from the beginning, but their efforts will really intensify between 1937 and 1939. Our program today is going to focus on stages one and two. The third stage, which we will address later in the week, is, is the actual expulsion of Jews into other territories beside the Reich, uh, mostly to the east, into, into Poland, occupied Poland. Uh, and so naturally, this stage doesn't begin until September of 1939 with the onset of World War II in Europe. And then the final stage is the mass killing and, and genocidal mass killing program that the Nazis began to carry out, uh, Germany began to carry out beginning in Eastern Europe in the summer of 1941. So these are the four stages. And, and one of the things that we should emphasize to students is that the Holocaust is not the same in the beginning, through the middle, and the end. It goes through changes. It develops over time. Now, when we look at the continuity side, we can ask the question, what did the Nazis intend to do to the Jews of Germany? And we can actually go all the way back to September of 1919, 
when the first bit of writing by Adolf Hitler about Jews was uncovered in a letter that he wrote while he was still in the German army uh, to a man named Adolf Gemlick who wrote and asked about the Jewish question. And what Hitler's answer was, he, he was given this letter and told to reply by his superior officer. Uh, Hitler wrote, in part, an anti-Semitism based on emotion will only find its expression in people getting mad and beating up the Jews. That's a pogrom. Um, but an anti-Semitism based on reason will lead to the systematic elimination of the, the privileges of Jews um, that treats them differently than other aliens who, who live in Germany. The ultimate objective of, of legislation and this reasonable anti-Semitism must be the irrevocable removal of the Jews in general. So this is what the Nazis are aiming for. Remove the Jews from the life of the German people. Of course, that means that they can't recognize them as Germans, and they don't, uh, because their definition of what it means to be German is racial, and Jews are excluded. Um, now, in the video that I prepared for you over the weekend, um, I did mention that we shouldn't rely only on post-World War I explanations for the rise of the Nazis and the beginning of the Holocaust era, but we should also not ignore them. So, so very quickly, uh, Germany's defeat in World War I um, came as a bit of a shock to a lot of, of German people, especially to German soldiers uh, who actually believed that they were, they were on the, the cusp of winning. And so the, the surrender um, the, the suing for armistice and peace came as quite a shock. Then on top of that, uh, many Germans considered the terms of the Versailles Treaty to be unfair, humiliating, um, different than, than what they had expected from Wilson's 14 points, uh, and many Germans felt betrayed. Uh, and this was not unique to the Nazis or not unique to the political right in Germany. Uh, the difference of opinion in Germany was mainly between those who said, we have no choice, we have to accept these terms, we are beaten, and those who wanted to hold out and, and fight on in some other way. Um, and, and so there is, a, there is a school of thought in, in the history of studying the Versailles Treaty that it certainly was not as bad as a lot of Germans made it out to be, and the treaty that they imposed on Russia when Russia withdrew from the war, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was actually harsher than the Versailles Treaty. So, so there's some room for saying that maybe uh, their complaints were a little bit overblown. Um, of course, their defeat in the war plus conditions in the 1920s uh, led to some severe economic difficulties in Germany. There was a rampant inflation in, in the end of 1923 and into 1924. Um, the war reparations demanded of Germany were a drag on the economy. And, and just when they began to recover from, from the great inflation, the worldwide depression hit in 1929. And as a result of that, economic difficulties destabilized Germany politically, socially, and economically and opened the door for more radical political movements. Um, on top of that, of course, a lot of Germans really weren't comfortable with, with the Weimar Republic or democracy in general uh, because it seemed to be introduced and, and maybe even imposed with German defeat. So there were Germans who equated democracy with defeat, um, and as a result, those who opposed the Republic, uh, both from the right and from the left, were willing to use uh, revolutionary violence to try to destabilize the situation. Um, Germany also had very little democratic tradition and, and the rise of multiple political parties seemed to be a sign of, of disunity and weakness. And, and it might just be an interesting thought experiment to suggest that the most stable political democracies in the world tend to have a very small number of political parties Oftentimes, like in our case, just two major political parties, uh, when you see a, a parliamentary democracy with multiple political parties, um, oftentimes those tend to be less stable. Now, that's not to say that the Weimar Republic was unstable throughout its history, um, but the potential for, for disunity 
uh, seemed to be near the surface to many Germans. So that republic, the Weimar Republic, was vulnerable to subversion, and the Nazis were there prepared to subvert. After all, they never claimed that that they were in favor of, of the Weimar Republic and always suggested that they wanted to implement a different form of government. Uh, now, yesterday, Shane shared with you the idea that that Nazi popularity in the in the period before they became the leaders of Germany tended to mirror economic conditions. So um, when the, the the inflation period was still um, going on in 1924, you can see that the Nazi Party uh, had a little bit of a higher percentage than they had later in the 1920s, 24 and May of 28. Uh, the party was still banned at, at this point, by the way, because Hitler and and his uh, cohort had tried to overthrow the Bavarian government in, in their infamous beer hall putsch. And, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to go into that, but the party really wasn't rehabilitated uh, until 1928 for, as far as the, the nationwide elections were concerned. Uh, but then you can see um, in between uh, 1928 and, and, uh, and uh, September of 1930, this is the beginning of the Great Depression and the Nazi percentage of the popular vote leaps um, to its high point, by the way, in, in July of 1932 with 37.3%. They would never exceed that, uh, that vote total in national elections that were freely held. Um, and so, you know, this idea that the Nazis won power democratically the way that we think of winning in America isn't exactly quite true. Uh, but they did, you know, Hitler became the chancellor legitimately uh, in the way, in the terms of the way that the Weimar Republic and parliamentary democracies work, where, where sometimes a plurality of the votes and the ability to form a coalition actually brings uh, a party and its leadership to power. So uh, um, this, this is one of the areas where there's a little bit of a disconnect um, between why some people in Germany like the Nazi party and what the Nazis themselves thought were was important. So, um, so the core idea, the key political and social idea of the Nazi party is racism. And here you can see um, in a couple of quotes from Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler writes, all the great cultures of the past that perished, perished only because the creative race died out from blood poisoning. So he, he suggests that there is a creative race and this blood poisoning is, is racial impurity. Um, and, and in order to stop that from happening, people in the culture need to be willing to fight fight for purity, fight for, for territory, uh, fight for existence. And so Hitler makes one of his most famous statements uh, in writing, those who want to live, let them fight. And those who don't want to fight in this world of eternal struggle do not deserve to live. So this, this military um, worldview uh, comes right out of Nazi racial ideology. Now, that doesn't mean they only appealed to the people of Germany based on, on their racial ideology. Look at some of the Nazi promises, what they say that they're going to do. Uh, they're going to redeem Germany and its people from its loss in World War I um, and, and, and what they lost in territory and, and position and power and economic strength and so on and so forth. Uh, they're going to reject the the ideals of the Enlightenment, the liberal values of, of human equality and civil rights and constitutional government in favor of their view of, of the Fuhrer state and, and the racial state. Uh, they're going to bring about economic recovery because people, of course, who are, who are desperate for work and desperate for, for income um, will follow anyone that they think can lead to better times. Um, they also, however, say that they're going to eliminate class differences. You know, with the rise of communism um, and, and a call for class conflict based on, on the, um, the, the communist ideals, uh, the Nazis had a different view. Um, they were going to elevate Germany as a racial state, not divided by class differences. 
between workers and owners and and uh, that, that such thing. Um, they're going to unite the people in this in this what's called a Volkish state, uh, which is uh, the Nazis have this term called Volksgemeinschaft, which means the community of of German people, and and implied under the Nazis community of blood, um, and they're going to they're going to bring back what they consider to be natural laws, um, not not humanitarianism but the survival of the fittest and scientific progress. And this is what we refer to as eugenics. And, and finally, uh, kind of the, the base underneath all of this is, is political and, and social and racial and even sometimes religious anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. Um, and and I, I just want to point out, of course, that, that inherent in all of these Nazi ideas is that the Jews are not Germans. And I pointed this out in my presentation yesterday, the Nazi political party program, all the way back almost to the founding of the party, uh, claims that to be a German, you have to have German blood, doesn't matter what your religion is, therefore no Jew can be a German, not because he's religiously Jewish, but because he's racially not German. Uh, now, of course, there is no such thing as German blood or German race, and, and Jews are not a race. This is a figment of imagination, but it's a very popular one in this day in, in the world's history. Um, so to, to sort of summarize a little bit of what, what Shane told you yesterday, uh, throughout the Nazi era, the Nazis have three overarching goals. They want to create total unity of the German people under Hitler's leadership, under the leadership of the Nazi party. Um, they want to purify and strengthen the Aryan race as as the wellspring of of the german nation and people and they want to expand the territory of germany uh in territorial conquest because in their ideology um the state is actually like a living being you're either growing or you're dying um now when you look at these three nazi goals it points out very clearly who their uh who their victims of persecution will be uh those who threaten political unity through political opposition or religious dissent, those who threaten racial purity, either eugenically like people with disabilities or, or racial outsiders, um, and then those who stand in the way of territorial expansion. Um, in Germany, people who have a pacifist outlook, for example, but also the people who occupy the, the lands that Germany will later target for conquest. Now, again, at the core of all of this is Nazi racial ideology, and, and, and this is one of Hitler's most profound statements of his belief that all human culture and, and all progress uh, through art and science and technology are really the creative product of the Aryan race, and those who are not related to this good race of the world are, are like chaff, useless and disposable. Um, and, and so here's a here's a direct statement that I think really should put chills down the spine um, when Hitler says it's the task of the racial state to ensure that at long last world history will be written and that the racial question will be elevated to the dominant position. And he goes on to say that that's the only way a generation will eventually emerge capable of facing the final and decisive decisions on this globe the decisions that will allow the survival of the Aryan race. But when Hitler says words final and decisive, it really ought to make us shudder because we know where this is going. Um, now, Adolf Hitler becomes the chancellor of Germany in, on January 30th of 1933. And although the cabinet only has three Nazi members uh, in a coalition of, of um, right wing and, and some centrist political figures, uh, Hitler is able through a series of twists and turns uh, to, to dominate. And, and the Nazis begin almost immediately beginning to try to coordinate German life according to the National Socialist worldview. Uh, I'm showing you here a, a quick timeline um, of how quickly this coordination actually happened. Um, on the 2nd of February, three days after Hitler becomes the chancellor, 
um, through emergency decree, political demonstrations are banned in Germany. Um, after the Reichstag fire, uh, President Hindenburg um, signs the, the Reichstag fire decree um, because the Nazis were able to communicate this idea that the burning of the Reichstag was actually the beginning of an attempted communist takeover. Uh, it actually was no such thing, although there isn't really the evidence that a lot of people claimed later that the Nazis set the fire. Um, it, it appears to have been the work of a lone um, arsonist uh, who was a bit on the mentally unstable side. Uh, nevertheless, it was a, a, a tailor-made opportunity for the Nazis to assert uh, a more direct form of political control under the idea that they had to take emergency action. Um, and, and Dachau opens in March of 1933, the first of the permanent concentration camps. And on the 23rd, the Enabling Act that Shane mentioned yesterday is, is passed. Um, and, and this essentially allows Hitler, through his cabinet, um, to rule by decree. Um, and this is really the end of, of German democracy, although the Weimar Republic technically still exists. Um, it's it's a, a shambling corpse, so to speak. Um, and, and from there on out, you get a rapid onset of decrees, um, a boycott, of, a one day boycott of Jewish uh, businesses just to set notice to the world that that the Nazis mean business. In, um, in dealing with the Jews, and, and a lot of that boycott uh, was to send notice to American Jews to, to quit their protests and mind their business and not try to launch a boycott against Germany in the United States. Uh, boy, there's a lot more to say about that, but we really just uh, won't have the time to go deeper there. Uh, the first major act that, that uh, institutes discrimination against Jews in Germany is the law for the restoration of the professional civil service where a lot of Jews are kicked out of their jobs. Um, and, and you can see if you just look down that timeline, um, you know, by, by the summertime, um, there really aren't any functioning and allowed non-Nazi political parties still active. Um, you have um, racial forced sterilization implemented and by the end of the year, uh, Hitler proclaims the unity of the German state and the Nazi party. So, um, you know, the takeover doesn't really take that long. And think of the ramifications of that um, for opposition, for political opposition. And, and if political opposition had not been able to organize and unite uh, and act aggressively very quickly, uh, the opportunity for them was perhaps uh, largely passed. Um, so here's here's just some some visuals to go along with uh, the boycott of, of uh, Jewish businesses. Note from the photo uh, that some of the text is in English uh, because the, the German government intended for this to be seen in newspapers uh, that would be read in the United States and in Great Britain. Um, also, I hadn't mentioned yet uh, the book burnings uh, that took place across Germany. Most of them took place on May 10th, although there were some that were, were near, but on other dates. Um, and many of the books were by Jewish authors, uh, but many of the books were also by left-wing authors who were not Jewish. Uh, Helen Keller's works, for example, um, and that's because she was an ardent socialist um, involved in left-wing politics and uh, a living example of the fact that, that people can overcome severe disabilities that would qualify them in the Nazi imagination for elimination from society. Um, now, there were a lot of Hitler's followers who, who were deeply anti-Semitic, and, and many of those men had gravitated to, to the, the, the stormtroopers, the SA, uh, the Nazi street fighters, so to speak. And, um, and when Hitler became chancellor, uh, some of these guys really launched into uh, sort of a an ad hoc series of persecutions uh, designed to, to really intimidate and hurt Jewish people. Nevertheless, you can see from the statistics here uh, just what's actually happening. Uh, by the end of 1933, 36 Jews are dead, but almost 36,000 Jews have departed from Germany for other destinations. 
So I think that those statistics sort of make it clear that the real impetus here was to try to drive the Jews out by making their lives so difficult and to, to conduct uh, that they would seek to go somewhere else. Uh, but that seeking would be under their own initiative. Um, a little more about the law for the restoration of the professional civil service. Um, Non-Aryan civil service servants are retired or dismissed. Uh, exemptions are made for World War I vets. Um, but there's a qualification in this that civil servants could be dismissed for political unreliability. And that even applies to non-Jews. Um, but one of the unexpected consequences is that these are, are government jobs that Jews are going to be removed from. But in this idea of coordinating German life under the principles of Nazism, many private employers also dismiss Jews, even though this law didn't require them to do so. Um, now, just, just one brief mention again, uh, but I know you heard about this yesterday, the beginning of the persecution of people with disabilities uh, begins with this law for the prevention of, of children with hereditary diseases. Uh, it establishes eugenics courts that have both judges and doctors um, to deal with people with, uh, who, who fall onto a list of um, conditions and compulsory sterilization is the legal method of implementing racial hygiene. Uh, by the way, somebody who was required to undergo this compulsory sterilization could in fact appeal the verdict, uh, but there's only one uh, appellate court and, and if you lose that case, uh, there's no appeal from that. Um, now, one thing to be said also here is that is that the, the Nazis will begin a process that they will use again later, requiring Jews to organize to rep represent themselves. Um, and they'll do this again later in the ghetto period during World War II. Uh, but you can see that in the time period of, of the, the, that remains to the Jews in Germany, um, a progression of, of the way they're considered when you look at, at the names of their organizations. First, they are the Reich representation of the German Jews. But after 1935, it's the Reich representation of the Jews in Germany, not German Jews, because the Nazis don't believe that Jews can be Germans. So now it's the Jews in Germans. Their alien status um, has, has become um, overt here. Um, but of course, representation require, I mean, implies still a legal status of some sort. So the last iteration of their representation is actually the right association of Jews in Germany. Now, one of the great historians of the Holocaust is Ian Kershaw, who coined a particularly useful phrase uh, that, that can be described this way. Um, Adolf Hitler frequently didn't tell his followers exactly what to do in agitating against the Jews. We, we obviously turn our attention to these laws um, and these policies which are implemented because they're very easy to, to, to itemize and, and, and understand. But many, many things are being done to, to diminish the position of Jews and to make their lives more difficult unofficially, and they're being done by, by officials, both of the state and of the party, all over the Reich, uh, but they're being done at lower level initiative because people begin to see that the way to get ahead in Nazi Germany is to figure out what the Fuhrer wants you to do and then work towards those goals using your own initiative. Those who are the most successful in working toward the Fuhrer get promoted, uh, and get more responsibility given to them, and that's the way to rise in Nazi Germany. Um, one of the next major uh, changes for Jews is the passage of the Nuremberg Laws in 1935. And there's two major laws here. The Reich Citizenship Law takes away the citizenship of, of German Jews uh, because since 1871 in German unification, Jews have been citizens of Germany, and even though the Nazis complained about this from 1933 to September of 1935, uh, it wasn't until that, that September of 1935 that they were ready to make the change, and Jews are deprived of their citizenship. 
But more than that, there's also a law passed called the Law for the Protection of German Blood and German Honor. And this makes um, marriage and, and, and sexual intercourse between Jews and Aryan Germans forbidden uh, under, under penalty of, of extreme punishment, incarceration in concentration camps. And so, so much did the Nazis fear um, Jews polluting the Aryan bloodline. They even forbade um, wealthier German Jews, uh, and there still are some but in 1935, not as many, um, from employing German women in their households. Um, they also are trying to establish this idea that the Jews may have a separate identity. Uh, it's just not German. Um, so, so this is really the, the, the idea of segregation. Jews can be Jews. Jews can have their own newspapers, their own uh, way of life. It's going to be segregated within Germany, uh, but they are, and they can even have their own flag, but they cannot say that they are German. In fact, um, at one point, Joseph Goebbels wrote or said um, that when the Jew speaks German, he is lying. Uh, that, that's kind of a, a, a pithy crystallization of their attitude. Um, now, this idea of the, the law for the protection of German blood and German honor, uh, it really does have teeth. Um, couples who are accused of race defilement um, can be not only publicly humiliated, uh, but severely punished as well. And, and Jewish children, for the most part, are still in school at this point, still in public school. Um, and, and this is particularly pernicious because they will suffer uh, ridicule and bullying and exclusion um, while they're still in the process of trying to receive an education. Um, now, the process of, of removing Jews from the public school has already begun, but it hasn't proceeded very far yet. And it will be a couple more years before um, that process is actually uh, fulfilled. Uh, so the status of German Jews around the time of the Nuremberg Laws is that about 25% are unemployed. Um, and of those are about uh, 10,000 public health and social workers. Uh, lawyers are, are not allowed to practice. Um, Doctors are, are expelled from hospitals and clinics. This also has to do with entertainers and people who would contribute to German culture, actors, musicians, writers, teachers, and professors. Uh, but this goes so far as even uh, to, to impact eight, count them, eight um, Jewish converts to Christianity um, who, were, who were employed as, as church organists uh, one thing to be noted here is that um, church employees in Germany at this time uh, were likely to be public employees, uh, unlike the way it would be an entirely separate uh, form of employment in the United States. Um, now, we're going to finish up this segregation period that step one um, with this very interesting quote from Joseph Goebbels. Um, in which he, he sort of um, reveals the thinking of the Nazis in the segregation of the Jews period, where he says, and, and he's actually saying this to newspaper reporters, um, he says, we don't have any interest in, in forcing the Jews out of Germany to spend their money elsewhere. Let them spend it here. Now, you know, we're not going to let them into every public resort, but maybe, say, we've got these resorts up on the Baltic Sea. Uh, maybe there's a hundred of them, and one of them will be for the Jews. It won't be the best one. It'll, it'll maybe be the worst of them. But there they can have their waiters and their business directors and their resort directors. And they can read their Jewish newspapers, and we don't want to know anything about it. Um, you know, it's going to be their place. It'll, it'll be worse than ours. But this is what we're going to give them. The others we'll, we'll have to ourselves, and we'll be separate, and they'll be separate. And he says, that I consider right. We cannot push the Jews away. They are here. We do not have an island to which we could transport them. We have to take this into account. By the way, later, the Nazis will have a plan. They won't stick with it very long to send the Jews to the island of Madagascar. But the idea of finding a territorial solution to the Jewish problem somewhere else in Europe or in the world 
is stage three, and we're not at that point yet. Um, now, this this push to to segregate the Jews in preparation for trying to force them to leave is is interrupted for a, a while in in 1936 because Germany wants to put its best face on uh, for during the Olympic Games. And the Olympic Games were, in fact, a, a propaganda triumph for Nazi Germany. Uh, Hitler was actually against holding the Olympics in Germany at first, uh, but his propaganda officials, including Joseph Goebbels, convinced him of what a great opportunity it would be to showcase Nazism. And, and their showcasing of Nazism was actually fairly effective. Um, but you can see uh, from the photograph on the right that there had sprung up around Germany most often spontaneously, signs that would say things like, Jews aren't welcome here, this is a Jew-free town, the Jews are our misfortune, and, and this, uh, this Dutch motorcycle tourist that you see uh, posing in this picture actually photographed a lot of these signs in 1935. They all come down in 1936, but after the Olympics is over, they all go back up again, and more still beyond that. Um, now, after 1936, uh, the Nazis begin to really ratchet up the, the social and economic pressure on the Jews, uh, really trying to bring about conditions where they will find life unlivable in Germany and seek to emigrate. Um, but another piece of the picture enters here because Germany has been trying very hard to expand its territory, not only to win back what they had lost in World War I, like, like the Saar Valley, which had been occupied by the French for a while, or, or the, the demilitarized Rhineland, which they marched into and occupied uh, in 1936. Um, but their, their, their first major stroke of success was, was occupying Austria and incorporating it into the Reich. Uh, and this is known in history as the Anschluss, uh, and they were unopposed um, militarily, uh, and, and in fact, maybe this was Hitler's greatest personal triumph uh, to enter Austria, his home country, his country of birth, um, as, as the, the leader of a, a new larger German empire, which Austria will now be a part of. Um, now, that's not to suggest that all Austrians were delighted, um, but many Austrians actually did not see this as a disaster. Um, but it also offered the opportunity for the Nazis to put pressure on the Austrian Jews, especially the, v the Viennese Jews, um, and to do to them in, in six months what it had taken six years to do in Germany, uh, a, a, a radical onset of, of persecuting pressure. And by the way, it's in this environment that, that a key figure of the Holocaust will really begin to make his reputation. You heard his name mentioned yesterday, Adolf Eichmann, uh, who, who went to Vienna and began to organize the, uh, the, the attempts to drive the Jews out there. Um, now, one of the things done to, to drive Jews out, you, you've already seen in this presentation how, um, how Jews uh, who were employed by somebody else either the German state or, or local cities and states, um, and even sometimes private employers were dismissed from their jobs. Uh, but there was a contingent of Jewish people who owned their own businesses. And contrary to Nazi propaganda, most of these Jewish people were not wealthy. There were some, some successful and, and wealthy Jewish business people uh, in Germany, uh, but most were small business owners and, and um, those who had successful ongoing businesses um, were middle class. Um, they, they lived a comfortable life. Uh, these people obviously did not lose their jobs in the first waves of Jews being dismissed because uh, Jews aren't going to be fired when they are the boss of their own business. Um, so the Nazis are going to begin putting pressure on Jewish businesses through all sorts of means um, to try to, to drive the owners out of business uh, or to coerce them to sell uh, at discount prices to, to Aryan owners. This is actually referred to this process as the Aryanization 
of Jewish businesses. And you can see how successful the process was uh, because in 1933, there were about 50,000 self-employed Jews. And by about 1930, July of 1938, before Kristallnacht, only about 9,000 will remain. And of course, after Kristallnacht, those, the rest will be uh, eliminated. And uh, I'll get to that in just a few moments. Um, now, this, this increasing pressure on Jews to drive them out of Germany creates the Jewish refugee crisis. And, of course, the reason that, that Germany can't actually drive the Jews out, just deport them, uh, force them into exile, is because that would require the cooperation of another country. Um, you know, the Nazis could push Jews to the border, but other nations, which they have not conquered yet, um, cannot be forced to accept Jews. And, and, by the way, it would be of no value to, to Germany to force Jews over into Austria, because they consider Austria to be part of Germany, you know, part of the greater German Reich. So they don't have any place to send Jews, and so they have to put on the pressure to get Jews to leave on their own. So Jews are trying, many Jews are trying to find a way out. Now, now some are digging in their heels. Uh, some don't want to leave Germany because they're Germans, and they love being Germans, and they really believe that this Nazi storm will ultimately pass. Um, and so they're, they're trying to batten down the hatches and, and hang on the same way that we do during a hurricane. Um, but many Jews are beginning to realize that maybe they need to get out, and they're trying to find a way out. It's very difficult. It's very cumbersome. Uh, trying to come to the United States, for example, is, is a torturous process of, of many permissions, all of which have to be done in a significant order. And, and if you don't get everything done, uh, things expire and you have to start over again. Um, and, and as this pressure increases on Jews to emigrate, uh, more and more countries of the world are, are either having to um, open their doors a little bit more or put up more robust barriers to stop Jews. Most are trying to put up more robust barriers. The United States doesn't actually change its policy at this point. In 1924, the United States passed a new immigration law, uh, the, the Johnson-Reed Act, um, which set quotas for immigration from countries to the United States. There was no Jewish quota. Um, the quotas by country. Uh, but there was a certain number of Jews who would be allowed to to come in from Germany, from Austria, um, you know, from other countries. This this is, does not apply to the Western Hemisphere, but uh, but to uh, I'm sorry to you know South Central and South America, uh, but certainly from Europe and and other parts of the world. Uh, and um, the United States won't relax its restrictions, uh, but it doesn't really tighten them either. Uh, not officially, but unofficially, the quotas are not filled. So it's the State Department actually putting up paper walls and, and official roadblocks through documentation and visa requirements uh, that stops many Jews from coming. And in fact, one of those Jewish families that tried to make it to the United States and couldn't get the job done was, was the Frank family, Otto, Edith, Margot, and Anne. Um, and, and it has now been discovered that the Frank family was in the process, but could not complete that process before it was too late. Um, the Evian Conference uh, brought nations together uh, into, into a conference to try to see if they couldn't come up with a refugee policy that would allow uh, for more Jewish people to, to escape from Germany. Uh, but no countries really were, were pressured to change their laws. and um, you know, most didn't, uh, and the United States didn't, and, and Franklin Roosevelt had instructed our representatives to, to make no agreement that would actually be binding on the United States. One country, the Dominican Republic, agreed to accept a small number, small increased number of Jewish refugees, uh, but even that was not entirely humanitarian in its, in its orientation. So the Evian Conference was a failure, and the Nazis noted that. Um, the rest of the world doesn't want them either. And at this point, you can, you can hear Hitler in speeches making reference to the idea that 
you know, the, the, the democratic countries of the West, the United States and Great Britain cry big crocodile tears about how we're treating the Jews. But when they actually have a chance to take Jews in themselves, they don't do it because secretly they agree and, and they want to leave us stuck with the Jewish problem. Now, you know, how much Hitler was, uh, was putting that on as a political statement and how much he actually believed that um, is, is open for, for question. Um, but what does happen is that um, Nazi Germany also tries to uh, remove some, some Jews who didn't have German citizenship, um, but whose citizenship was Polish. They try to send them back to Poland uh, and Poland doesn't want to receive them. Uh, Poland has, in fact, started to initiate a legal proceeding whereby um, Poles who have been outside the country for a certain amount of time will lose their citizenship. Uh, when, when the German leadership realized that this was a process that was beginning, they wanted to ship uh, Jews who had Polish citizenship back to Poland right away. And, and they rounded some up, put them on trains, shipped them to the border. Uh, Poland wouldn't take them in, not at first anyway, and, um, and a crisis ensued. Uh, the nearest town was Zabanshin, and, um, and, and finally, out of humanitarian concern, uh, the Polish government allows these Jewish refugees from Germany to, to come into Zabanshin, and, and the Jews of, of Warsaw are actually asked uh, to send provisions and supplies for them. Uh, one family that was sent away um, on this deportation was the family of Herschel Greenspan. Uh, Greenspan. And um, Herschel was not there because he had been studying in France and living with an uncle, but he had overstayed his student visa. And so now he was he was illegal in France. And actually, his uncle was getting frustrated with this and wanted him to leave. Um, and, and so he's got all this pressure on him. Then he gets a letter from his sister from Zabanshin saying, you wouldn't believe this awful disaster that's happened to us. Uh, we've been removed from our homes. We've been shipped with nothing. Uh, we're now stateless refugees. Uh, we're in this refugee camp just inside the Polish border. You know, who, what's going to become of us? And he gets this letter and he's so distraught. And he's just, he's, he's an older teenager. You know, he, um, he, he does a foolish thing. He goes to a store, he buys a gun, and he goes into the German embassy and he says, I want to see the ambassador. Well, you know, when somebody comes off the street and says, I want to see the ambassador, you don't get sent right into the ambassador. He gets sent to the office of a, of a junior official uh, named Ernst von Rat, and he had told, um, he had told the, the desk clerk, I've got some documents uh, that I want to give to uh, the ambassador. And so uh, Von Rott comes out from behind his desk and says, I understand you have some documents for me. And, and the way this is reported is Herschel uh, reaches in his coat, pulls out a gun and says, here's your documents. Blam, 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 blam. And he shoots him. Um, and that was on November the 7th. And, and Von Rott dies of his injuries on the 9th. Uh, the Nazis used this, uh, this act of a single person to blame all the Jews of Germany uh, for what they called uh, a coordinated attack, and and nationwide riots were, were launched against the Jews all over Germany. Uh, this is the event which is referred to as, as Kristallnacht. Although I do want to let you know that um, that that's not really a preferred term. It was one that actually um, the the Germans liked. Um, they thought it was it had a, a poetic ring to it. Um, so in the scholarship, this is now often referred to as the November pogrom. Um, but it's so commonly known as Kristallnacht that, that I'm just going to say you don't need to hesitate to call it Kristallnacht. Um, it's the way this event is known and commemorated in the world. Uh, and this was an utter disaster for the Jews of Germany. Um, the remaining businesses that existed uh, were, were looted and vandalized and destroyed. Um, at least 91 Jewish people were killed in the violence of, of, of several nights. Hundreds more Jews were beaten and assaulted, probably thousands, you could say. In fact, there's, there's no agreement on the number of synagogues and temples that were desecrated or destroyed. Uh, the smallest number you hear is, is in the 260s, uh, but there are others who suggest that maybe uh, the number was even over a thousand. 
Um, and I, I imagine there that, that the difference there is, is the level of destruction that's being described. Uh, but 7,000 Jewish businesses were, were destroyed, looted, or vandalized. And, and that night, um, the night of November 9th into 10th, approximately 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent to concentration camps, mainly uh, Dachau, Sachsenhausen, and Buchenwald, depending on where in Germany you lived. Uh, and you heard um, Sonia Marchesano yesterday uh, say that this had happened to her father. She also said he was released within about 10 weeks. And this was common. Um, and the reason here is very simple. Um, and you heard Shane mention this yesterday, but I wanted to be a little more explicit in this explanation. When the concentration camps were created in Germany, they were not mainly for Jews. And when Jewish people were prisoners there, they were recognized and labeled as Jews. But in all likelihood, the reason they were sent was for some other um, offense against the state. Um, perhaps they were Jews and members of the Communist Party, or perhaps they were Jews and Social Democrats, or perhaps they were Jews and accused of race defilement. Um, just being Jewish is not enough at this point, not because the, the Nazis don't want to persecute the Jews uh, through incarceration, but simply because they want them to leave. And since they want Jewish families to leave, not just individual Jews, you can imagine that if a family member is incarcerated in a concentration camp, that's not an in inducement for the family to leave. That's an anchor inducing the family to stay. Um, so when these Jewish men were arrested, uh, the Nazis thought about this as another step in applying pressure. So they, they really treat these Jewish uh, internees in the camps terribly. They, are, they are, are beaten and assaulted and some are killed. Um, but the families are, are let to know if they can finish their preparations and, and their get together their requirement documents to emigrate, then their, their husbands and fathers will be released. And in a short period of time, they'll be required to be out of Germany. So you can see here, the camps are not being used as a form of perpetual incarceration for Jews, um, like is gonna happen later in the war years, uh, but rather um, as another form of pressure to get them to leave. Um, you can see some photographs here, uh, but you can see dozens in, in, of photographs where Jews are being marched off uh, after Kristallnacht, Jewish men to the camps. Um, a, a fine of, um, of over a billion Reichsmarks is levied against the Jewish community to pay for the damage which they suffered. And one of the, one of the, the most devastating things that happens is that Jewish businesses that were insured against their losses, the insurance payments were made, but taken by the state and not allowed into the hands of the business owners. Um, in the aftermath, of course, um, the, the ratcheting up of, of Aryanization of Jewish property was accelerated to the point that less than a month after Kristallnacht, uh, most Jewish property was out of Jewish hands. This is also the final step in expelling students from Germ Jewish students from German public schools and, and a broad comprehensive attempt to finally eliminate the Jews from the economic life of Germany altogether. And, and this is around the time when Sonia mentions that her family has to go into housing for Jews only, uh, whereas before that this had not been the case. And, and here most Jewish survivors will actually say that, you know, who, from Germany, that this is the moment when they knew that, that they couldn't stick this out, uh, they couldn't hunker down and survive, that, that Jewish life in Germany was actually coming to an end. And this, this is why Kristallnacht is often seen as a real turning point. But there are some more things coming before the war. Um, Germany will occupy the Sudetenland area of Czechoslovakia uh, at the beginning of October in 1938. This promote, uh, provokes what's called the, the Munich Agreement, where um, th this is the famous act of appeasement uh, by the by the British and the French uh, as they stand by and allow Germany to, to occupy uh, part of Czechoslovakia. Hitler's excuse is that the Sudetenland is almost exclusively or, or heavily German speaking 
and, and so these people belong in the Reich. And, um, you know, people who, who had learned not to trust the Nazis by this point uh, said, you know, obviously they, this won't be their last territorial grab. Um, but the um, but uh, Neville Chamberlain, the prime minister of Great Britain, negotiates with Hitler, uh, tends to believe this this statement that this is the last major population of, of Germans living outside the Reich once they are incorporated uh, Hitler will have the boundaries of his territory. Of course, that doesn't last very long. Um, Germany occupies the remainder of Czechoslovakia on March 15th of 1939. And in nobody's estimation is that uh, German-speaking territory. Uh, so even those who had believed in appeasing Germany to this point, uh, for them it's the big uh-oh moment uh, because now they see that, that there isn't any limit to German territorial demands. Um, some, like I said, had recognized this already, uh, but even those who wanted to give Hitler and his movement the benefit of the doubt are now disabused of their notions of, of German peaceful intent, but they are way behind in arming for the coming conflict. Uh, Germany's been rearming the entire time Hitler and the Nazis have been in charge, and... Um, they aren't quite ready for war yet. Uh, Hitler had told his generals that if their uh, taking of Czechoslovakia uh, is resisted, that they were to withdraw. But of course, it was not. Um, now, in addition, however, to, to winning more territory, every time the Nazis uh, managed to, to take another slice of territory, they also get more Jewish people. So at the same time that they've been trying to reduce the number of Jews in Germany, they're acquiring new Jewish people. And, and for those who really are dedicated to driving the Jews out of Germany, um, their anti-Jewish policies seem to be making less progress than they had hoped. Uh, the status of Jews by 1939, just before the war, is uh, they are completely segregated from the rest of society. They're under curfew. Um, they were required to append Jewish names uh, to their given names if those names were not on an approved Jewish list. Uh, their passports and identity documents are marked with a big red letter J. And by the way, that was requested by the Swiss government uh, as they were starting to put up barriers to try to stop uh, Jewish refugees from entering Switzerland. Um, Violence against Jews is not only happening in Germany, but German influence on other countries uh, has led to violence against Jews in other nations as well. Um, and and as we're we're sliding towards the the World War, the onset of World War II, other countries are even becoming more hesitant to accept Jewish refugees, and they had been hesitant in the beginning. So opportunities for emigration are becoming more and more scarce. And then we end up with, with a famous speech delivered by Adolf Hitler on January the 30th, 1939, six months before the beginning of World War II. Um, in this speech, he mocks the Western democracies for their complaints about Nazi behavior towards Jews, uh, while they are unwilling to take in uh, Jewish refugees, and Hitler actually says he's willing to give them the Jews. He'll pay for the Jews to leave, but he knows that the, the Western countries won't take them because they also really secretly agree. Um, and then he makes this statement. If international finance jewelry, both inside and outside Europe, should succeed in plunging the nations once more into a world war, then the result will not be the Bolshevization of the earth, and thus the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. And by the way, you can listen to this speech. Um, I've given you a link on this slide where you can go, if that's still a good link, and it's still up on the History Place, you can listen to Hitler make those uh, that statement and the wild applause that he receives um, when he says this. Um, and, and this is really the in the last moments. Um, one thing that does happen after this, in May of 1939, um, one group of, of Jewish people trying to get out of, of Germany uh, board a ship known as the St. Louis. Um, the people on the St. Louis are in the process of, of mostly trying to get immigration visas to the United States, but they have not 
completed that process. What they have obtained is landing certificates to go to Cuba. Uh, what they did not know is that those landing certificates were bogus, uh, that the Cuban official who had issued them had not had the permission to do it and was, uh, was uh, engaged in a form of corruption um, taking the fees. Um, so when the boat made Havana Harbor, um, the Cuban government would not allow the, the passengers to disembark. Um, and the captain, who was very sympathetic, uh, tried to find another port where the passengers would be allowed to disembark. Uh, they tried to appeal to the United States. Cables were sent to the Roosevelt administration. No reply was ever given. Um, the, only, the only tacit reply was when the ship was finally ordered to leave Havana, Havana and had to go back to, to Europe. Um, the United States dispatched a Coast Guard cutter to interpose itself between the ship and the Florida coast around um, Miami to make sure that no one would actually try to jump the ship and, and come ashore. Um, but the St. Louis was a bit of an exception. The United States did not stop all ships from coming with Jewish refugees to the United States. In fact, they almost always allowed them in. Uh, the reason that the St. Louis was different is that on other ships, Jews didn't actually obtain their tickets and come until their visas were approved, and those who were coming had permission. So the St. Louis is actually a case not of the United States just saying no to Jewish immigration. What it was is, is the United States willing to be inflexible, or not willing to be flexible, in, in suspending its immigration laws and policies for humanitarian reasons. And, and that is a black mark, uh, but not the way it's usually described. Um, so that's where we're going to leave this presentation, uh, the, the pre-war part of, of the Holocaust uh, leading up to September 1st, 1939. Uh, I, I do want to, to say to you that uh, there could have been much, much more included in this presentation. This really was a fast run through, but I, I wanted to give that to you so that uh, you would be prepared uh, for what you're going to hear in, in the sessions on Wednesday. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this presentation, and um, I look forward to seeing you in session on Wednesday morning. Thank you.